Coming up on Tech Thing, we're getting capped. Is Comcast capping you too? Glasswire found out just what's using your network, six speakers and headphones from Rocky Mountain Audio Fest and so much more all coming up on Tech Thing. FreshBooks is offering a month of unrestricted use to all of our viewers, totally free right now, and you don't need a credit card for the trial. To claim your free month, go to freshbooks.com slash tech thing and enter tech thing in the how did you hear about us section. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Patrick Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we have something useful in every single show. Some days we have incredibly useful things and incredibly expensive things and incredibly delightful things and sometimes even cheap things. Yes! I'm just a random non sequitur kind of thing with feet today. <laughs> All of the above! It must be the rage, people, <laughs> at No Free Support, aka Evil Engineer Tweets. At Tech Thing, hey guys, can you cover Comcast implementing the one terabyte cap for 18 states starting November 1st? The entire West Coast is screwed! And if he had a link to a if you can't quite hear that on your speakers, one, a little later in the show, we got some great, great, <laughs> great options for better audio quality, and two, that is the sound of Shannon seething at the sort of bass and sub-bass level of human hearing. That's um, like the same noise I make if I don't get some Starbucks during the day. Yeah. <laughs> a hangry snubs is a dangerous beast. So, okay, so, so Evil Engineer tweeted out, Comcast gets closer to nationwide data capital expansion in 18 states. Um, you know, it's, uh, we posted this on facebook.com slash tech thing Monday morning. If you haven't seen it, um, look kids, how does the Xfinity terabyte internet data usage plan work? And you scroll down and oh, you get between six and 700 hours of video. And what it basically comes down to, this is about Comcast getting users um, under one terabyte or paying an extra $50 per month for the unlimited data option because they have punitive punishments uh, otherwise. Um, it starts November 1st, 2016, and it's not just the entire West Coast. The list is epic, right? This is the stuff starting in November 1st. Uh, Dothan, Alabama, California, Colorado, Florida, North Florida, Southwest Florida, West Palm, Southeastern Georgia, Idaho, Indiana, uh, at least the big cities, Kansas, Michigan, Grand Rapids, Lansing, Detroit, Eastern Michigan, Minnesota, Minnesota, Missouri, New Mexico, Western Ohio, Oregon, Texas, as in Houston, Utah, Washington, Wisconsin, which joins, hey kids, look at that, Alabama, excluding the Dothan market, so all of <laughs> Alabama now, Arizona, Arkansas, Florida, Fort Lauderdale, the Keys, and Miami, Georgia, excluding southeastern Georgia, look at that, they're completing states, uh, Illinois, northern Indiana, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maine, southwestern Michigan, Mississippi, Tennessee, eastern Texas, South Carolina, and southwest Virginia. Yeah. So, you know, Comcast kind of downplays this. What can I do with a terabyte of data in a month? Stream between 600 and 700 hours of video. Play on game <laughs> line games for more than 12,000 hours. Stream more than 15,000 hours of music. Upload or download more than 60,000 high-res photos. Um, but I feel like you would chew through it pretty quick with the way technology is going right now. A few Windows 10 updates. 4K, UHD, oh, yeah. streaming video is becoming more and more popular. There's new devices coming out. The Roku just came out with a 4K streamer. So, I mean, Netflix is including new 4K content and so is Amazon Prime. Uh, it, I'm going to guess that we're going to hit that one terabyte <sighs> limit pretty quickly. Well, I mean, I'm already hitting 500 myself. I was gonna say for September, which was a light month in my household, uh, we hit 610 gigabytes. Um, uh, by the way, Comcast, thank you for finally making it easier to track your data usage without burying it. Um, <laughs> that said, 4K is really going to be enriching uh, for Comcast, right? Yes. Netflix's recommendation for 4K, or excuse me, it's 5 megabits per second uh, ah. for HD quality. That starts at like 720p. 25 megabits per second, which is recommended for ultra HD quality. Oh, wow. That turns into 11 gigabytes per hour, which oh, under wow. a one terabyte cap is approximately 90 hours of 4K viewing. Yeah, so, so. I've, I've pretty much argued many times that caps are basically just pure profit for businesses. That's well, what it is. Or perhaps Comcast networks are deeply overloaded by video that, yeah, I don't know, you know, I mean, it's <laughs> ironic, true. right? Even because one of their business executives said that it was a business, ex uh, business uh, a, a choice of theirs, not a technology-related choice. Now, remember that whole thing earlier about having really good speakers or earphones and hearing the sub-bass rage oozing from snubs? Mm -hmm. Watch this part. So, you can use the free market options for one of the many Comcast... Uh, <laughs> 
oh, you don't have <laughs> alternatives to Comcast that'll oh. deliver more than 10 megabits either? Uh-huh, exactly. Yeah. For my job, I have to have Comcast. Um, it's the only thing that's available where I live. <sighs> In any case. <laughs> So that's how I feel. I'm aware that a lot of different places have already had data caps, and it sucks. Yeah, it's no fun dealing with data caps at all. It's it's profit for companies, and that's exactly what well, it is. It's a way for them to get more more money out of you. And technology is growing so fast that we need more unlimited right. plans. We need the ability to you know just do unlimited. It would be nice to have just, or or just alternatives, right? I mean, basically, alternatives would be great I can, too totally see within six months I'm going to be paying an extra 50 bucks a month for Comcast or I'm going to severely curtail our usage, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, or unless they decide to change the cap at some point or on the upside. Um, it used to be 300, so right. that's that's a good point. Yeah. 300 relatively unenforced, now they're going to do one terabyte enforced and they're bringing it online just in case, just the 4K thing is coming. <laughs> 2016, big year for Comcast. Mm. Google. Anyone? Fiber in my neighborhood? <laughs> please, huh? please. Huh? <laughs> All right, let us know what you think. Ask at techthing.com. I'm sure some of you out there are thinking, this is ridiculous. And a bunch of people out there are thinking, you Americans, complaining about your caps. And then there's going to be people like Japan and Singapore that are just laughing and pointing at the screen right now. <laughs> I'm just saying. Singapore. Since we are talking about bandwidth Singapore's usage, number one, woo! That's crazy. They have wow. such fast speeds over there. If you've it's never insane. seen it, the list of countries by internet connection speeds. Wow. Okay, okay. Global average connection speed ranking, South Korea. <laughs> but peak connection speed ranking, Singapore. Jeez. That's nuts. Okay. Hey, oh, hey, we're, we're number something. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're pretty far down on that list. So anyway, I figured we could talk about Glasswire. Uh, one of our viewers actually sent it in. He mentioned Glasswire and said that it's a good choice for monitoring your network activity. So if you're interested, you can download this from over at glasswire.com. It is free or $49 for more access to more features. Uh, so basically for the free version, you get a graph of network traffic, a firewall to block certain apps. You get usage reports and notifications. I'm and staring at the screen them. because it's pretty. <laughs> it is pretty. And then you can also get this incognito mode. And then if you want to purchase it, you can see what's connected to your router or modem. You can lock down uh, certain things. You can also lock down your webcam or mic if it detects that it's on. And you get more server monitoring simultaneously as opposed to in separate graphs. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go through the software on this and kind of give you a feel of what you can do with each of the different tabs. So the first one that you see on there is called Network Graph, and this one gives you peaks, which represent programs sending or receiving data on the network. And luckily, you can sort the graph in two different ways. You can either, either do it by apps, uh, all obviously, and then traffic. So traffic lets you see different protocols, such as DNS, HTTPS, FTTP, et cetera, et cetera. And then apps, of course, sorts by what kind of application it is. So if you click on a specific uh, peak, for example, while you're in the apps version or on all, it'll show you down at the bottom if it was Google Chrome, uh, what country it was from, and what application was signaling that kind of data connection. Mm -hmm. And then it'll give you the hosts that it was connected to. Uh, the next tab on there is Firewall. That one allows you to block certain apps, and it also lets you simply use the internal Windows firewall for control. So you don't have to really turn on any separate firewalls here. As long as you have the Windows firewall turned on already, that's all you have to do. So you'll see all these little fire tabs next to each of the apps. If you turn one of those on, like Google Chrome, for example, and then you try to do something in Google Chrome, it's going to block you because the firewall is now blocking that app. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. I, OK, I'm going to be honest with you guys real quick. My husband plays a lot of WoW, so I kind of want to download this on his computer and then just hide it and f firewall block it <laughs> in the application settings <laughs> and totally troll him. So it'll be on there and be like, why is it WoW working? I'll be like, I don't know. Well, he's going to love that. <laughs> There's going to be lots of humor in your lots of laughter. <laughs> in For Shannon's me, house. until I get in trouble. OK, so moving on. <laughs> Usage reports. So this shows the network data reports. You can set notifications for bandwidth monitoring if you want. Uh, this basically shows you what kind of usage you're actually using on just that computer. 
So if you want to track other computers, that would be a completely <laughs> separate task. Uh, but this will show you what's going on on your machine. Uh, you can list it by incoming traffic. You can see just external traffic. Mm -hmm. So you can see if stuff is going on on your local connection as opposed to going out to the internet. So that would be for like, if your computer is talking to your Sonos, for example, that would be internal traffic. External would be you going up to the Google server to get information for your Echo, yeah. for example. Uh, so usage monitor shows only the bandwidth usage for that computer. Keep that in mind. That's very important. So don't use this necessarily on one computer if you're trying to track your entire connection bandwidth usage. The thing that kind of blew my mind is you look at this list of apps and hosts, and then you get like 347 more wow. down under the hosts. Um, but yeah, it is actually really slick to see the difference between your local traffic uh, it is. and your external traffic. It's useful. I mm -hmm. love seeing how much data is just going through on the back end, on the, in the background, mm -hmm. uh, while you're not really necessarily doing anything on your computer physically. Uh, so the last thing is alerts. Those tell you if any uh, changes were made on your network, like when a new program first connects. This can be really extremely useful if there is malware detected on your computer, mm -hmm. because the malware will come up in here as a separate app, and it'll say this is the first network activity of this malware connecting, and it'll show you what the .exe is of that specific thing. Uh, that's trying to connect to the external world on the World Wide Web. <laughs> so very, very useful information there. Um, and then in the settings, that's up in the drop-down menu up at the top, you can set up this incognito mode. Uh, you can turn off network history. You can snooze notifications if you want to. Uh, one thing that I thought was really cool is the ability to set up a remote server. So that's in the client tab. Uh, when you click into the client tab, you can set up a remote server, and that will let you track not just your computer, but also another host on your network. So it could be maybe my husband's computer could be the second one or whatever it might be. Um, oh, and it stopped working again. Uh -huh. So this is one thing I wanted to mention, too, is that every time yeah. I tried to set up a remote server, it crashed on me. Um, I did send a message over to their customer service, so mm -hmm. I'm hoping to get a reply back about that, but I'm thinking it just is a bug that needs to get a quick software update. Yeah, I mean, and it's happening on the case. Windows 7 to Windows 10 machines. Yeah. So it did crash repeatedly, which was so sad because I really, really wanted to test that out. So the last thing I wanted to mention on the software side was the network tab. So this is cool because it lets you notice what devices are detected on your network. So this could be not only like your Sonos and your Amazon Echo, but also the two computers and the laptop and the iPad and the iPhone and all of these different things that are connected to your local area network. But Shannon, no matter but how I click. I know. Yeah, you have to pay for it. So <laughs> I did want to mention, though, that you can do this with Nmap as well. And that's the <laughs> Linux command line program with Nmap-S uh, capital P for port. And then you put in your local area network slash 24 for the port number. That will show you all the different items that are on your network, too. So that's one workaround if you feel like getting like digging deep into terminal commands. It's one of those really cool things things that I learned when I was using network mappers. Yay, Nmap! Yay! Um, so yeah, that's about it. I'm, I'm not keen on upgrading unless I could definitely connect other PCs on my network. Since it's crashing, I think I'll wait. Um, I want to see if other people have had that issue too, but I'm, I'm just going to assume right now that it's just a bug. And since remote access crashed, I'm just going to wait a little bit longer, but I would totally spend 50 bucks to it's, get bandwidth monitoring on of different devices. I would love to see this built into a router. Yeah, oh, that would be awesome. I mean, that's one of those things. I'm, I'm looking at the Eero along with the Amplify, and as they add additional features, they're getting close to something like this. Not as pretty. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it is $50, but I, I love that they're doing like but webcam that's one time and, too. And, and mic detection. You can lock everything down. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. It's but. very cool. I, I love the fact that with the simultaneous uh, usage, if you you know do the upgrade, right. you can see everything in one graph as opposed to having like separate tabs for everything and having to do the math yourself. So it is nice that they include all those nice features uh, with it. But man, I just want to see the remote server and not crash, man. That's just the one thing. That's yeah. the one thing holding me back. $49 for one PC and three remote connections, six months of history, $99 for three PCs, one year of history, and 10 remote connections. Yeah, it's not bad. Tempting.
<laughs> Let's do the thing. I want to see it in the router. Yes, me too. <laughs> Let us know what you guys think or if you have any other network usage, mm -hmm. statistical software that you or like tips. to spend your time on. Yes, or any tips for other software that you like to use. Uh, send them over to us, ask at techthing.com, or you can also tweet us at techthing, at snubs, and at Patrick Norton. You're running a small business, you got maybe some billing issues, or just trying to figure out how to figure out if you're actually making money yet? You should check out FreshBooks. I used to be the worst at billing clients until a couple of years ago when Shannon whispered in my ear and said, FreshBooks. She's been using them for more than four years, so we were delighted when FreshBooks came on as a sponsor. They make creating and sending invoices incredibly simple. Instead of putting off invoices till I'm desperate, I can create and send an invoice in about 30 seconds. It is super easy. Now, FreshBooks is getting even better. They've redesigned their cloud accounting software from the ground up, custom built for the exactly the way we all work. The all new FreshBooks is not only ridiculously easy to use, it's also packed full of powerful features. Of course, you can still create and send professional looking invoices in less than 30 seconds, and the customizable invoice styles keeps you looking professional. The new dashboard view lets you know exactly where your money is and where it's going. You can set up online payments with just a couple of clicks and get paid up to four days faster. Sound good? You can see when your client's seen your invoice and put an end to the guessing games. Getting started on FreshBooks is extremely simple, even if you're not a numbers person, especially if you're not a numbers person. FreshBooks is offering a month of unrestricted use to all of our listeners, totally free, right now, and you don't need a credit card for the trial. To claim your free month, go to freshbooks.com slash tech thing and enter tech thing in the how did you hear about us section. That's freshbooks.com slash tech thing and enter tech thing in the how did you hear about us section. And we want to thank them for their support of tech thing. Three questions answered, three reviews, three picks, all in three minutes, and this week's rapid fire roundup is Patrick's picks from Rocky Mountain Audio Fest last weekend. Did you get to hear all the things? Not quite. Oh. There were a couple things I didn't hear, um, <laughs> but I discovered it's really hard to take good pictures of speakers in poorly lit hotel rooms. Yeah, I can yeah. agree with that. Are you ready, sir? I am ready. Go! Number one, uh, this is pretty crazy. Uh, Odyssey's iSign 10 and iSign 20 in-ear planar magnetic headphones. This is kind of a classic uh, planar magnetic headphones. They're kind of big. They've got the whole like help me Obi-Wan, <laughs> you know, Princess Leia look going on there. They do. Uh, then they came up with the sign, the Odyssey sign. So these are on ears and I swear they, they are much smaller in real life than they look uh, when I hold them up right here. Now Odyssey has essentially stuffed 30 millimeter planar magnetic drivers into an in-ear, which Ooh. feels better on your, uh, than it looks uh, in the ear. So it's kind of crazy. This is a 30 millimeter planar magnetic. That is the ear hook that wraps around. And you don't have to stuff it halfway to your oh, brain. Oh, that's cool. They're kind of, you know, tricky to get on because I only had a couple chances to play with a couple of them. But this is a planar magnetic earphone. And it gives you that big giant stage and high-end detail. And it's pretty much flat all the way down. These are not cheap. You know, they are about uh, $399 for the iSign 10. Oh, wow. uh, the iSign 20, which has a longer uniforce voice coil that covers the ultra-thin diaphragm to a greater extent, enabling better control and responsiveness for better bass clarity and improved imaging. Costs <laughs> $599, we're taking oh, pre-orders now. Well, look at this, it is crazy. Because um, essentially, right, you're talking about thin material, magnets, managing yeah. airflow, and you know, getting a clean signal into it. Um, I was shocked That's some at how gorgeous good they technology. Sound. It's they're pretty. They're not inexpensive, but they are. Oh yeah! By the way, you get a lightning cable for that price, what? and there's a lot going on. And they're made in California. Oh um, cool! So nothing wrong with that. Not cheap, but they did sound really, really good. And yeah. it's been amazing to watch. Actually, it's been amazing to watch all of the advances in headphone technology in the last couple of years. But to see planar magnetic sound that good in that small a package was really, really crazy. Very cool. Another thing I ran into at a bunch of places, um, Rune Labs, or uh, Rune is a well, they want to build the music player for music lovers. Uh, I caught it first in the Peachtree Audio Suite where they were finalizing the playlist to show off a bunch of Zoo Audio speakers. Cool. I'll show you those in a second. Then ran into the app again in Elac Suite where it's the heart of the Elac Discovery music server. And then realized, hey, you know what? You know, because it's Rune is like $119 uh, a year. Oh. It's $499 for a lifetime membership. Okay. Um, but the idea is that instead of having sort of a list of tracks, right, you know, here we have a vinyl album, here we have a list of tracks, uh, what they want to do is give you kind of a delightful interface into your music. 
And so that when you, it searches your tracks, it connects your title streaming, um, you know, so that you have a really big, fat, awesome musical experience. Do they have um, a free trial so you can test it out? They do have a free trial for you to test it out. It's free okay. trials at runelabs.com. This is way different from like Volumio or Rune or UNE running on a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Uh, I should also mention that title lossless was everywhere. Oh. And since I mentioned them, I should probably show you uh, what those Zoom audio, the Zoo audio speakers. Yeah. These are high efficiency, efficiency like 97 dB speakers. Um, they do some gorgeous, gorgeous stuff that sounds pretty impressive. Cool. I think this was like, I can't even explain to you, right down here at the bottom, that's about an 18 inch subwoofer. Hey, that's a pretty good picture for a hotel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> probably they were, this was during setup. Uh, I gotta say, Zoo audience, uh, they, they make everything, except they basically bring in drivers that they make more than 50% of in their shop yeah. in Salt Lake City. And the thing you saw there was the, you know, the connection plate on the back of it, um, which they have their own custom option for inputs. But I just, you know, the whole wow. thing is built like a brick outhouse with love. Um, <laughs> they also have a tremendous sense of humor. Remember Elax Unify UB5 bookshelf speakers, the one I was gushing about back at CES? Mm -hmm. Stupid good for $500 a pair. Mm -hmm. I got to hear Unify's slim towers. They add an extra pair of five and a quarter inch aluminum cone woofers. Doesn't really extend the base below 42 hertz, but it gives it extra oomph. It's like having a big old eight inch woofer there. Um, they were also showing off, the. this is the actual Unify Slim and then they also had the bookshelf version of the oh. Unify Slim. They both pretty much sound the same, but it's thinner, taller, and rocking a deep, glossy paint job, which uh, pretty much adds 50% of uh, to the price. Oh, jeez. So, you know, Elac's excellent uh, debut bookshelf speaker started at $280 a pair, if this sounds like too much uh, money for you to spend, even at $500 a pair. But yeah. it's like, it, I was like, you know, it goes from $500 a pair to $750 a pair for the bookshelf speakers, but that's because they have to sand and paint and sand and paint, and it adds right. $250 of labor and awesomeness. Uh, Elax coming with an 80 watt per channel integrated amp and DSP, the Element EA101 EQ integrated amplifier. Boy, that just rolls off the tongue. Um, <laughs> it does some really sick room correction and blending with you, uh, uh, blending with your sub. Um, so if you take a look at what's going on, it'll actually pick up the signal levels in the room Whoa. for both your main speakers and the room modifications and then to blend your subwoofer in. You can stream Bluetooth to it. It's got uh, USB inputs, a bunch of interesting stuff going on there. I loved the, uh, oh, there it is, where it's actually measuring That's and then really cool. modifying the entire curve. It was amazing to see DSP stuff starting to show up in high-end audio because traditionally it's like, no, pure <laughs> signal path, but this has the ability to make things sound better and to adapt to the fact that everybody's room is a little different and the room That's has a huge true. impact on the audio. Um, I love the entry level rooms from $500 on up. <laughs> and it was just like, they included speakers. <laughs> In some cases, like, you know, this was uh, audio engine speakers connected to uh, like a U-turn audio turntable. Oh, nice. Um, it was really, really awesome to see the principals from PSB, uh, Hi-Fi Man, Mr. Speakers, and Focal talking headphones. Oh, uh, with, oh, wait, is this the one where you were like, if a meteor strikes you right yeah. now, audio is over? Yeah, literally, this is like <laughs> Hi-Fi Man, Focal, uh, this is uh, Tile from Interfidelity, Jude from HeadFi, uh, Dan Clark from Mr. Speakers, Paul Barton from PSB. Like, if wow. a meteor went through the roof of this building, like, everybody but Sennheiser <laughs> would be out of business, right? Um, Getting Aww. to listen to some of the crazy high-end stuff. Uh, this is the Mr. Speaker's uh, uh, Ether C Focals Utopia. Um, Kef putting their $1,500 uh, LS50 speakers back to back with their $25,000 Blade oh speakers. My gosh. Um, what else? Oh yes, PS Audio had. I didn't even bother to find out the name of this speaker system. There's wow. one, two, three, four, five, six of these gigantic subwoofers. I mean. I'm pretty sure this speaker system and set of amps costs more than my house. <laughs> yeah. No disrespect to PS Audio if I'm wrong with that. The Sprout's much more affordable. Uh, this is uh, Devone Audio's Grande, which sells for $24,000 with shipping. Jeez. 22500 without. Well, I mean, they're gorgeous. They sound pretty amazing. Yeah. In case the idea of a $25,000 music system makes you want to vomit, you mm -hmm. want a rockin' music system for 180 bucks, pick up Fios X1 Lossless Media Player, sell them for as little as 85 bucks on Amazon. They just lost his second gen model. I got to hear, sounds good. And one more is triple in-ear, triple driver in-ear headphones. This was pretty much the combo I listened to in the airport all the way home. Cool. And if you want over-ear, Sony's uh, $75 MDR7506 is a nice place to start. Oh yeah. And this t-shirt rocked. This t-shirt, I just want to say this t-shirt made me. Lossless makes you a better Aww, listener. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> 
So yeah, it was. I love that. It, it was good. You got. To, I got to hear stuff I never would hear otherwise. Like, I, did did we just go through five things? I think we six. hit six. Okay, yeah. seven if you count the t-shirt. That was definitely our top three rapid fire round. <laughs> if anybody has a question, if you have problems. any audio questions at all, definitely hit this guy up. Email ask at techthing.com. We'll be sure to check him out and get him on the show for you. Audio Quest Dragonfly Black if you want better audio out of your computer. Andrew went to the contact page over at techthing.com and he asked, have you been experiencing this in the US? Samsung S7 has been recalled because they are spontaneously combusting and the replacements are doing the same. And he also linked us to the sun.co.uk. Are you having similar problems? Yeah, yeah, we are. <laughs> Samsung S7 smartphone overheated then exploded in teacher's hands in the middle of a busy cafe. Um, yeah. There's a, this is, a, Samsung actually has, well, okay, first of all, it's worldwide. Samsung has already recalled 2.5 million Note 7 phones, and then the replacements started burning, and while they're not talking about it yet on Samsung.com, at least when we taped this, Samsung is officially ending the Note 7 as of Tuesday, October 10th. So uh, get yours back to wherever it came from if you have one. The New York Times, there's a crazy, uh, yeah. Brian X. Chan and uh, Cho Sang Hun, uh, this. Oh yeah. my gosh. Um, Samsung enabled pinpoint Galaxy 7 note problem kills its production. Um, you know, they basically announced that to uh, what seems to be Korea's equivalent of the SEC today, uh, the South Korean Stock Exchange uh, late on Tuesday. They basically, they can't figure out what it is. They're ending production. They're no longer going to make or market the Galaxy Note 7. Um, wow. At least uh, said someone who was speaking anonymously. There's a really good article on the Times. We'll link to in the show notes. If we have a Galaxy Seven Note, uh, Galaxy Note Seven, Samsung advises that you power down the device immediately. Contact the wireless carrier retail store where you bought it for details about getting a full refund or exchanging it for a Galaxy S Seven or S Seven Edge model. If you bought it from uh, uh, Samsung's website. Or if you want more information about the recall, you should call the company at 1-844-365-6197 or samsung.com slash us slash note 7 recall. Jeez. This is oh, It makes me kind of sick to my stomach. Like I, I know what a headache it can be to manufacture products and get them out on the market. And the huge headache of having to deal with multiple different providers for chips yeah. and batteries and everything. And oh my gosh. Samsung's kind of digging themselves into a hole with this one, and it's really sad. And I'm finally, I'm glad they finally stopped just mm -hmm. all production on them, just stopped it, so that they can move on well, from once this. You, once you've done a recall, oh, and wow. the models you built after the recall are yeah, it's like yeah, it's one about time up, to stop. You know, this is one of those moments where you're like, how do I extinguish? Lithium oh, gosh. ion fire. Samsung. I don't even know if it's the batteries on fire, but like you know, um, yeah. Let's not even get into that. It's it's <laughs> it's it is something I was thinking about. Like you know, if your if your phone bursts into flame, if you're on a plane, yeah, that would be really scary. Uh, if anybody out there has had this happen to them, write in. I'm kind of curious to see if if any of our viewers have had their own Note Sevens burn into a heaping pile of flame and sadness. It sounds like a terrible experience, which just, makes me want to hear about it. Just let us know you're safe. Reason. I don't. Yeah. I let don't... us know that you're alive and okay. <laughs> oh my goodness! You know, right. it's it's a tiny fragment of the. My understanding is it's a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of total right. production, but you know, it's a dangerous problem to have, though. So I'm glad that they are stopping that production. Yeah. Uh, moving on, mm. <laughs> Jeff has been getting his multi-tester on and measuring the output from various USB chargers combos and posted all of these different ones on facebook.com slash tech thing. This is very, very cool. He says, I've noticed a lot of variances. I could buy a cheap AC adapter that kills it with 2,500 milliamps per hour charges uh, with two USB ports, but after two weeks it starts to hum and drops down to barely 450 milliamp hours. What have you found to be the best cables and AC adapters? Hmm. hmm. I feel like you probably know some of these. <laughs> there has been some nerding out in my life. Um, <laughs> okay, first of all, it's not just amperage and voltage values that are a problem. Sort of the cleanliness of the power can be ugly too. Somebody did a, uh, 
a great study with an oscilloscope looking at a half dozen different uh, USB chargers. Oh. And generally speaking, the cheaper you go, the less likely you are to get a, a quality power at the level you expect with any kind of life expectancy. Got it. Generally speaking, factory uh, USB adapters uh, from Apple or Samsung uh, and very reputable third parties tend to deliver the best, cleanest power. That said, I bought a Dell laptop charger a couple months ago off of Amazon.com, and I'm pretty sure it's counterfeit. Uh, because after three weeks, it would no longer uh, be recognized as generating the appropriate voltage. And that doesn't wow. seem like it. Maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm, uh, you know, I, I've never seen this before after, on this particular series of power supply, and I've been using these power supplies for like five years, four years, a while. Um, so buying from the factory store might be a very, very good idea. There's been issues on Amazon for quite some time yeah. with, with counterfeit products making it into the sort of uh, delivery pool. Uh, factory USB cables, in my experience, tend to be awful. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Apple. Less time <laughs> on the AirPods, more time on cables that don't suck. Uh, and we're noticing various third-party manufacturers' uh, design or quality varies and changes from year to year. Mm -hmm. So far, my anchor cables are doing great, both micro USB uh, and 30 pin and lightning, but most of them are from late last year. And it, it's kind of funny, if you go to the wire cutters article on the best USB cable, everybody's yeah. like, well, it must have changed because this year they're not so good. But <laughs> it's also one of those areas where there's so many vendors that are competing. You never know when Very some true. vendor is astroturfing on another vendor's um, reviews. There's a lot of funny reviews on Amazon on <laughs> That's bad days. Very, very true. <laughs> so just, you know, I, you know, Amazon Basics seems to be good. Monoprice seems to be good for the mm -hmm. most part. Uh, I've had a lot of good luck with Anchor. Yeah, me too. You know. There's, An Anchor's my fave. There's Kevlar wrapped cables, which fascinate me. Actually, I think there's a Kevlar cap wrapped cable from Anchor or Monoprice. We'll figure it out. But <laughs> that, I don't know if that helps, but uh, factory USB chargers third-party cables, and we just listed a whole bunch of options. Yay! And we also got a message from Blake, who wrote ask at techthing.com. He says, hey team, I've been working on ultra-wide screens for a while. I really recommend Divi from Mesage to help manage all those windows. Just be careful and be sure to buy the right version for your OS. Their buying experience is a little confusing. <laughs> and he also linked us over to mesage.com slash windivi. Windows management at its finest. I like the video because it makes so much more sense in the video where you basically, <laughs> where you basically, come on, there you go. You basically oh. select a window and then Divi lets you decide what portion of the window. <gasps> what? Oh, that is cool. Yeah, that's my three columns. There's your three columns. There's my three columns. Thank you, Blake. That's cool. This yeah, thank slick. you. Um, I want to use that on my home Windows computer. Well, you have to pay money. It's thirteen dollars really cool. ninety-nine cents after the free trial. Worth <laughs> it. <laughs> I'm okay with people making a living. Yeah, me too. It's crazy. <laughs> Patreon.com/slash/techthing. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes, all the things. Thank you so much, Blake. Really, really helpful. Uh, love that. And I'm going to let you take the analog pick this week since it was your pick. And remember, once in a while, put down the phone, step away from the screen, and close the laptop and do something analog like Nikki who writes in, my tip for something analog, go see a car race. It's awesome. I went to the European Le Mans series at Spa Friend Corchamps this weekend, and it was amazing. Just make sure you wear ear protection. Those crappy foam plugs worked better than I expected. You could see two Renault RSO1 cars being towed after they made contact. The famous Eau Rouge corner while race cars are driving through it at insane speeds. It's so steep in real life, I couldn't believe it. A Formula One car doing some demonstration laps. I think it was Kimi Rockin's 2013 Lotus painted in the current Renault F1 livery. And here it is going through La Source Corner, an LMP2 car exiting the pits. SMP Racing BR01 Nissan Finish 6. Oh my goodness. So much excitement. <laughs> That's cool. I don't know what any of those words meant. Shiny, awesome cars. <laughs> going fast. It's like RS what? I don't know. I don't race cars. It's like sports ball for me. <laughs> I've seen you driving fast. <laughs> yeah, in my Ford. <laughs> you, 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 she's... Thank Speeder. you for setting that in, Nikki. Yeah. That was awesome. Very, very cool. He also wrote, please check out the Vivaldi browser. I think you'll like it. And I've been trying really, really hard to download the Vivaldi browser. Um, but every time I try to download it, I get this. Watch it start. Oh, no. Oh. Well, I've tried two different locations, two different networks, two different machines, three different machines now, and several browsers. 
I'm denied. We will keep trying. We will. I'm Patrick. Keep trying, Norton. <laughs> I'm Shannon. Don't know nothing about cars, Morse. <laughs> and we'll see you next week on Tech Thing. Did I show you my most recent snubs report? It's where I put a light bulb into my brake fixture mm -hmm. on my car. And I made it all like 1990s where the camera's moving back and forth. And I'm like, yo, what's up? Welcome to my car show. Yeah, I put yo, it on TV my, raps. It's on my YouTube channel. Yeah. Or no, you know what it it's was? Like, it was the beach house that used like to do that. that where they would sit. Welcome to the real and world. And the signal. Yep, that's what it was. Camera always must be moving. I was like, this is going to be so cool. Thank you to everybody who is supporting our show on Patreon. Really appreciate everybody that you can see here. You want your name on this list, you can hit up our Patreon account. Patreon.com slash tech thing. Yeah, that, and it's down there. Oh my goodness. Got a question, a tip, an app you want to share, ask at techthing.com or tweet at techthing at snubs or at Patreon.